Hi everybody, Dr. Sunil Dand, internal medicine physician. Why doesn't natural immunity count in the United States? That is the question. And as is following a pattern over the last few years, it is not American medical journals and scientific discussion and media that is raising the right questions. It falls upon foreign overseas publications to be asking these questions. And I made this point in a video a few weeks ago, but I'm going to talk about a great article that was recently published in the British Medical Journal. When I first moved to the United States, which was not that long ago, I remember that this was the land of medicine and science. I remember during my medical residency, we used to have the most fantastic discussions. We used to get opposing points of view. We used to debate passionately. We used to debate research and we used to do so respectfully. That era seems like it has gone and it is a tremendous shame for good medicine and science. I want that America back that I first moved to and we're going to have to fight to get it back because right now in our great and noble field we have some people who don't want to debate and ask questions at all. They are the opposite types of people. They want to censor, they want to silence and they want to intimidate. These people are a stain on our great profession. Now the debate regarding natural immunity is an interesting one because again there's always these people out there who think in extreme Dreams. They think that as soon as you mention this topic, that means that you somehow want people to get infected, you want people to suffer. This is absolutely ludicrous. I don't know anybody that would deliberately want to get an infection if there's an effective vaccine available. But natural immunity is kind of a fact of life and of science and of biology. Human beings wouldn't have come this far and survived this long if natural immunity didn't exist. Remember, we didn't even have vaccines until a couple of hundred years ago. We're very lucky to be living in this era of modern medicine, but we cannot deny natural immunity. And there's many people out there who through no fault of their own have got COVID-19 recovered from it and now have this question on their minds. So I'm going to quote pieces from this great article that was published in the British Medical Journal within the last couple of weeks. Vaccinating people who have had COVID-19, why doesn't natural immunity count in the US? The article starts off by telling us just how many people in the United States have already had COVID-19. The substantial number of infections coupled with the increasing scientific evidence that natural immunity was durable led some medical observers to ask why natural immunity didn't seem to be factored into decisions about prioritizing vaccination. The CDC instructed everyone, regardless of previous infection, to get fully vaccinated as soon as they were eligible. Natural immunity varies from person to person and experts do not yet know how long someone is protected. As more US employers, local governments and educational institutions issue vaccine mandates that make no exception for those who have had COVID-19, questions remain about the science and ethics of treating this group of people as equally vulnerable to the virus or as equally threatening to those vulnerable to COVID-19 and to what extent politics has played a role. The evidence. Starting from back in November, we've had a lot of really important studies that showed us that memory B cells and memory T cells were forming in response to natural infection, says an infectious disease expert. Studies are also showing that these memory cells will respond by producing antibodies to the variants at hand. The article then goes on to quote references to articles which support the durability of both vaccine and infection-induced immunity. But the studies kept coming. An NIH-funded study found durable immune responses in 95% of the 200 participants up to eight months after infection. One of the largest studies to date, published in Science in February 2021, found that although antibodies declined over eight months, memory B cells increased over time, and the half-life of memory CD8 and CD4 T cells suggests a steady presence. Real-world data have also been supportive. Studies in multiple countries, including England, Israel, the US, have found infection rates at equally low levels among people who are fully vaccinated and those who have previously had COVID-19. Cleveland Clinic surveyed its more than 50,000 employees to compare four groups based on history of COVID infection and vaccination status. Not one of over 1,300 unvaccinated employees who had been previously infected tested positive during the five months of the study. 
Researchers concluded that the cohort are unlikely to benefit from COVID-19 vaccination. In Israel, researchers accessed a database of the entire population to compare the efficacy of vaccination with previous infection and found nearly identical numbers. Our results question the need to vaccinate previously infected individuals, they concluded. As COVID cases surged in Israel this summer, the Ministry of Health reported the numbers by immunity status. Between the 5th of July and 3rd of August, just 1% of weekly new cases were in people who had previously had COVID-19. Given that 6% of the population are previously infected and unvaccinated, these numbers look very low. The data suggests that the recovered have better protection than people who were vaccinated. But as the Delta variant and rising case counts have the US on edge, renewed vaccination incentives and mandates apply regardless of infection history. The article then goes on to talk about other countries which do give past infection some immunological currency, including Israel and some European countries. Although it's too soon to say whether these systems are working smoothly or mitigating spread, the US has no category for people who have been infected. The CDC still recommends a full vaccination dose for all, which is now being mirrored in mandates. The article then cites a member of the FDA who says, We do know that the immunity after vaccination is better than the immunity after natural infection. In an email, the FDA spokesperson said the comment was based on a lab study of the binding breadth of the Moderna vaccine-induced antibodies. The research did not measure any clinical outcomes. I repeat, the research did not measure any clinical outcomes. It appears from the literature that natural infection provides immunity, but that immunity is seemingly not as strong and may not be as long-lasting as that provided by the vaccine. But not everyone agrees with this interpretation. The data we have right now suggests that there probably isn't a whole lot of difference. One of the experts also points out here that while vaccines are focused on only that tiny portion of immunity that can be induced by the spike, Someone who has had COVID-19 was exposed to the whole virus, which would likely offer a broader based immunity that would be more protective against variants. The lab study offered by the FDA only has to do with very specific antibodies to a very specific region of the virus. Claiming this as data supporting that vaccines are better than natural immunity is short-sighted and demonstrates a lack of understanding of the complexity of immunity to respiratory viruses. We then go on to talk about antibodies and the very interesting fact that antibodies are not to be used as a defining metric of immunity because antibodies will go down after natural infection. That's how the immune system works. If antibodies didn't clear from our bloodstream after we recover from a respiratory infection, our blood would be thick as molasses. The real memory in our immune system resides in the T and B cells, not in the antibodies themselves. This is a very important point. Even if your antibodies wane, you still have memory cells which will be kicked in if they encounter the virus again. The piece then goes on to talk about the logistics of the vaccination program. While some argue that the pandemic strategy should not be a one-size-fits-all and that natural immunity should count, other public health experts say universal vaccination is a more quantifiable, predictable, reliable and feasible way to protect the population. Apparently, a medical director of a U.S. testing and vaccine distribution company says he initiated conversations about offering a finger prick antibody screen for people with suspected exposure before vaccination so that doses could be used more judiciously. But everyone concluded it was just too complicated. It's a lot easier to put a shot in their arm. Others, however, are raising questions of the fairness for the millions of Americans who already have records of positive COVID test results, the basis for recovered status in Europe, and equity for those at risk who are waiting to get their first dose. Logistics aside, a recognition of existing immunity would have fundamentally changed the target vaccination calculations and would also affect the calculations on boosters. As we continued to put effort into vaccination and set targets, it became apparent to me that people were forgetting that herd immunity is formed by both natural immunity and vaccine immunity. There's a very clear message out there that, okay, well, natural infection does cause immunity, but it's still better to get vaccinated. And that message is not based on data. There's something political going on around that. The article then goes on to talk about the toxic political situation right now in the United States. 
Well, I have very little to add to that section other than to say that history teaches us that when politics mixes with science and medicine, the results are always a lose for humanity. It is a toxic mix. So is there a different risk benefit analysis? There's a discussion here, but I want to highlight this particular part. If natural immunity is strongly protective, as the evidence to date suggests it is, then vaccinating people who have had COVID-19 would seem to offer nothing or very little to benefit, logically leaving only harms, both the harms we already know about as well as those still unknown, says a vaccinologist and professor in global health. The CDC has acknowledged the small but serious risks of heart inflammation and blood clots after vaccination, especially in younger people. The real risk in vaccinating people who have had COVID-19 is of doing more harm than good. A large study in the UK and another that surveyed people internationally found that people with a history of COVID infection experienced greater rates of side effects after vaccination. Among 2,000 people who completed an online survey after vaccination, those with a history of COVID-19 were 56% more likely to experience a severe side effect that required hospital care. A representative of a university in California said the sky-high antibodies after vaccination in people who were previously infected may have contributed to these systemic side effects. Most people who were previously ill with COVID-19 have antibodies against the spike protein. If they are subsequently vaccinated, those antibodies and the products of the vaccine can form what are called immune complexes, he explains, which may get deposited in places like the joints, meninges and even kidneys, creating symptoms. Other studies suggest that a two-dose regimen may be counterproductive. One found that in people with past infections, the first dose boosted T-cells and antibodies, but that the second dose seemed to indicate an exhaustion, and in some cases, even a deletion of T-cells. I'm not here to say that it's harmful, one of the authors of the study said, but at the moment, all the data are telling us that it doesn't make any sense to give a second vaccination dose in the very short term to someone who was already infected. Their immune response is already very high. And I leave you now with the final paragraph. When the vaccine was rolled out, the goal should have been to focus on people at risk, and that should still be the focus. Such risk stratification may have complicated logistics, but it would also require more nuanced messaging. A lot of public health people have this notion that if the public is told that there's even the slightest bit of uncertainty about a vaccine, then they won't get it. This reflects a bygone paternalism. I always think it's much better to be very clear and honest about what we do and don't know, what the risks and benefits are, and allow people to make decisions for themselves. That is a fantastic piece in the British Medical Journal, and I encourage everyone to read it. The link is down below. When we're talking about science, coming back to this point that was raised in the article, if we want to do something because it's logistically easier, that is not the way we should be thinking in medicine and science. And remember again, we are talking about immunity, which can be easily proven on various lab tests. This is not something that is made up. Again, natural immunity is a scientific fact, and it should be being debated appropriately within the medicine and science communities. This was put very well to me the other day, actually by a retired teacher, who raised the point that actually it is almost elementary school stuff that we teach young children. You recover from an infection and you will develop some antibodies. And it's a very valid scientific and medical debate how long those antibodies last and whether or not a vaccination afterwards would produce any benefits, but we mustn't be silencing this important discussion. It should be something that we are talking about and doing so will also help restore public trust. So again, coming back to the title of this article then, why does the United States not recognize natural immunity? Thanks everyone for listening. Let me know your thoughts down below. Dr. Sunil Dan, MedStroit Lifestyle Medicine. We'll speak again very soon.